lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're in the right chairs, we are. Oh, they've all sat down. Oh, they've all sat down. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This has been a, a very special day for us here at the National. It is today our 50th birthday. This morning, the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh visited us backstage and had a 45-minute backstage tour. They saw a rehearsal of Emile and the Detectives. They saw a rehearsal of a song from Guys and Dolls, which will be part of the 50 Years on Stage show a week on Saturday. They visited our new props workshop, and they were bade farewell by Joey, which was, uh, which, which, which was uh, all of it uh, a, a, huge, a huge success. Uh, they plainly enjoyed themselves, and we all had um, a terrific party uh, while they were here, after they were here, and <laughs> the, <laughs> the, 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 the star attraction uh, this morning, uh, d the Queen had, uh, d was particularly delighted to meet Dame Joan Plowright, um, Lady Olivier, uh, who was, of course, part of the very first company uh, that uh, opened the National Theatre uh, at the Old Vic in 1963. And now we have uh, six members of Laurence Olivier's National Theatre, six extraordinarily distinguished actors, all of whom played uh, at, the, at the Old Vic uh, under Sir Laurence's direction. And one of them was there on October 22nd, 1963, and to him I will be asking the first question. But they are Gorn Granger, Ronald Pickup, Sheila Reed, James Hayes, who has performed in more different productions than any currently living uh, actor. <laughs> <laughs> Although not as many, uh, not anything like as many as Michael Bryant, uh, Michael, Michael Bryant, who has the record. He, he was in 55 different productions. Uh, Michael Gambon and Geraldine McEwen. Please. Uh, uh, <laughs> it was Michael Gambon who was in Hamlet. Uh, were you not, Michael? Yeah, very and, uh, first production. Yeah. What, what do you remember of that night? I just remember, I don't remember much. I, I bought a new pair of shoes that day when I <laughs> rehearsal. I never had to speak. I was just at the back with a spear. And I had to come on in a later scene. So I had nothing to do, but I was d delighted to be in it. I'm so impressed, you know. Yeah. And um, I used to walk out the stage door at night. It was in the other road at that time, on the main road, the stage door of the National. Yeah. At the old thing. Yeah. yeah. And I used to put myself just behind Sir Lawrence as he was going out into his car <laughs> to seem as though I was one of his friends. You know? <laughs> 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 I'd say, goodbye, Sir Lawrence. <laughs> <laughs> Desperate. <laughs> were, were, any, were any of the others, you, others, others in the house on that night, on the, on the 22nd of October? Not me. No? No. 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 Was, was anybody here uh, in the house on October 22nd, 1963? I was. You were? Yeah. Oh. What, do you, what do you remember? Well, welcome. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Thank you. Um, That's good. I think, did were all of you on stage with Sir Lawrence at some point or another? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. Sheila, what, what do you remember of being on stage with Sir Lawrence? Mm. Well, I suppose uh, it's a bit like playing tennis with somebody better than yourself. <laughs> um, hopefully you get better. Um, I had some extraordinary experiences with Sir Lawrence, actually. Um, yes, the master builder was one. Um, I was playing uh, his secretary, who was deeply in love with him. And at one point, I had to fall to my knees uh, on the ground and grasp him around his knees and um, embrace his legs. And my wig got caught in his <laughs> watch chain, so you can imagine what it looked like <laughs> from the front. That was quite embarrassing, but we got over that one with quite a lot of laughter. 
He was amazing to be on stage with. He just emanated such energy and uh, strength and virility and humor. Well, he was my god and still is. Mm. Uh, Ronnie, Three Sisters, I can remember seeing when I, uh, the, the film of Three Sisters when I was quite young, and, and it, it remains with me vividly. What was, what was that like? Well, I was, I'd been in the company for a little bit by then, so I was a bit more relaxed. He, he directed it, of course, and he, was, he played Jim Putikin. Yeah. The wonderful Derek Jacobi had, was, had played the part I was playing, and Derek then played Andre in the film that right. you are uh -huh. referring to. Well, as, as Sheila said, it was fantastic. See, I mean, I was a real oddball at school. I, my hero was not Stanley Matthews, the footballer, which it was for most of my mates. I'm afraid it was Laurence Olivier. And uh, I'd seen him as Hamlet uh, with my parents. They took me to see the film, and I was fascinated by this extraordinary creature. And from then on, I was fascinated by acting. And I saw him as Richard III, and I spent the whole day in school imitating Richard III, which got me a lot of street cred. <laughs> a lot, in fact. And I thought, this is good stuff, and I'm going to be an actor, and I want to work with Laurence Olivier. And amazingly, at the age of 24, thanks to an, an audition by a very kind set of people at the Royal Court, I came here, here, there, to audition for him. And rather than being nervous, I was just so exhilarated that I was going to meet my, my hero. And I showed off in front of him and thought I was doing pretty well because youth is brash. And he said, yes, that's all right. You've got a lot of tension there. <laughs> and he pulled me up off my feet. And he was, of course, absolutely right. Two years at RADA, they'd been trying to tell me that and do something about it and failed. But anyway, I was here. I am rabbiting along. And uh, I was here, and then I <laughs> did various things before Three Sisters. And it was wonderful being directed by him in the theatre and in a film. And his, his adaptation from stage to film was, rem was remarkable, and you realize that he was a master of everything. His attention to detail was wonderful, and his he was a life force, though. I mean, it, as Sheila mentions, the energy, he was a life force, and uh, he, everything was unpredictable. Mm. There's more I can say a bit later, but I better not go on now. No, I have a break. Can I just say a tiny little bit about Three Sisters? Because we, we, we did have two streams then. There was an A stream and a B stream at the theatre. And I remember when we had, came to the first rehearsal of Three Sisters, he said, um, director's perks, he said, I've picked from the A stream and the B stream, and I've got you mixed up for the three sisters, because <laughs> you're the people I want. So we all felt very, very special. <laughs> and what about Dance of Death, Geraldine? That must have been, that must have been quite a... Oh, it was amazing. Yeah. Yes, amazing. Uh, I, I had worked with him before I was uh, in his company. I'd done um, the entertainer with him at the palace. So I had kind of worked with him, but didn't really know him. And um, <clears throat> when... Um, uh, I first entered the company, he said to me, you can do comedy, so you can do anything. So I thought, oh, well, that's all right with me. <laughs> and um, I then proceeded to play the most amazing uh, lot of parts. And then Dance of Death came up, and um, I was amazed that they wanted me to do it, because I was actually um, 35 at the time, and we were cel in the play we were celebrating our silver wedding anniversary. Um, <laughs> But he was quite amazing. Um, yeah, the rehearsals were fascinating. And we used to start the play sitting on our own on the stage with the curtain down. And then the, uh, before that, he'd always be walking round. I'd be still. And he'd be walking around, and he'd be practicing the dance that he did, which he loved doing. He loved that sort of thing. And um, uh, the, the play would start. And it was at that time where he'd not uh, I, I think he hadn't been ill, or he'd been a bit ill, I don't know. Anyway, he'd always said to us all, nobody is prompted at the National Theatre. If you go wrong, you just get out of it yourself. So um, that used to happen with him occasionally. <laughs> and um, he used to walk around the stage in total control of what he was doing and saying totally appropriate things. But um, we had this slight joke about it. 
And um, we do this hour and a half, the first act was, and the only other actor who came into it was Robert Stevens. And by the end, we'd been haranguing each other. It's this really ugly relationship. And um, he'd be sl slanging me, and I'd be crying, and then I'd be doing it to him. And at the end of the show, of the first act, the curtain would come down slowly like that, with us sitting at this table. And uh, I'd be in tears and all that. And then we'd just look at each other uh, when it stopped down there. And then we'd look, and then we'd smile, and then we'd laugh because we knew the various things that had happened during the act. <laughs> and um, when he'd sort of gone a bit, you know, wrong, <laughs> I mean, he didn't make it sound wrong. He, he was, you know, he was so busy. I mean, it was all all right. But anyway, we'd laugh <laughs> and we'd, we'd, my memory of, of him is us two walking off the stage for the interval and walking to our dressing rooms absolutely roaring with laughter. <laughs> I think maybe it was because it was such a tense and dramatic play, you know, and uh, it was wonderful. And he was simply marvelous to me. When I joined, he said, you can play comedy, so you can play anything. And I had 11 absolutely fantastic roles, major roles in great plays, from Fado's Flea and her Ear to, um, the White Devil, Webster, all, all you know, fantastic. Um, but at the end of uh, the Dance of Death evenings, he always had a little bottle of champagne on my place for me <laughs> at the end. His dresser always put it there. And he used to give me, his uh, driver used to give me a lift home, and we'd take him, we'd take him to Victoria Station. And um, he'd get out at Victoria Station, and there were all masses of people, you know, getting trains and that. And I found him not only such an amazingly creative and strong person, but also a slightly sad person, as great people often are. And he used to walk away from me, from the car, with his you know, reasonably old Mac on, and a trilby, and a briefcase, walking through all these people to go to his train to get to Brighton. And I thought, and there you are, you've just given this magnificent performance, which it was. It was absolutely stunning. Mm -hmm. And I was so touched by him. He was a remarkable person as well as a remarkable actor. Yeah. Mm. 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 Yeah. Jimmy, your, your memories. I, I went into that Dance of Death for a short time. And in my opinion, that was the finest stage performance of his oh, I yes. ever saw. Yes, it was fantastic. less um, in the, less makeup used. It, it seemed to be grounded in something very deep within him. And he, the, the, who directed that? Glenn Bymshaw. Glenn Bymshaw. Mm. It opened. I thought, here we go, Strindberg. I saw it before I went into it, and I thought, oh my God, this will be heavy stuff. And there was this very clever trick at the beginning, where there was quite a bit of humour. Yes. There's something about cards and That's cheating, right. and yes. he put his foot on the rail um, as if he was in a bar. That's right. But there was a lot of humour in yes. it, yes. So you thought, oh, this is going to be fun, <laughs> this is going to be fun. And then, of course, the real nasty, dark relationship Ooh, started. Dark, yes. And it was, um, it was astonishing. And I went into it to just be a sentry uh, for a few performs. I know Tony Hopkins had been a sentry, and uh, <laughs> uh, all I had to do was stand outside the window, and he'd come out and salute me and we'd have a bit of a chat, sotto voce, and off he'd go. But I remember also somebody on stage management had to learn Morse code. Do you remember that machine? Well, that's right. Mm. He yes. had a machine that he, uh, <laughs> yes. on that terrible island, Sweden, is it? Yeah. Uh, he, he was sen <laughs> sending messages on this machine and some, some stage manager had to learn and return. So they did messages over, the, it was extraordinary. Yeah, it was. But uh, that, um, was, was, I thought he was astonishing in that. I tell you what, he was fant his back was fantastic. Whenever you w I walked behind him, particularly mm -hmm. in the second act, and he was sitting there, I mean, his back was terrifying. It was, <laughs> it was most impressive. And his neck, yes. it seemed to expand. Yeah, I know, I yes. Yeah. And, uh, and you, you write that because uh, Long Day's Journey um, is, kind of the legendary performance, certainly from the second half of his time. Was he, you reckon da Dance of Death higher than Long Day's Journey? I, I, pers I personally do, yes. What, what was it like being in Long Day's Journey, <coughs> Ronnie? It's, it's terribly difficult. 
to muster a few articulate words. Yes. It was the most phenomenal experience of my life. Yeah. And I knew at the time that if I did nothing else, um, <laughs> I had sort of died and gone to heaven. It was, I know it sounds silly, but for an actor who had worshipped this man, you know, for all those years, to be on stage with him for an hour, which that final scene is, was, was quite remarkable. And, and you learn an awful lot about somebody who is many things in rehearsals and socially, but sitting opposite somebody in a scene of that dependence on one another. Mm. His generosity, which people don't always talk about, although thank God people have tonight, and because we all know it, his generosity of playing with you yes. mm. was extraordinary. Mm. And I mean, there was one speech, which I have, the longest speech I have in the scene, as opposed to the two speeches he has, where he uh, uh, talks about how he could have been a great actor. Uh, and I tell him, as a sort of almost like a present, Michael Blakeman has directed it so beautifully, as a present to him, I tell him about my dream when I go to sea. And uh, the way he listened was so tender and so much changed in him, in his feelings about me. I felt it every night and I, it just fills me up thinking about it. And I don't mean to be embarrassing, but it was a, a rem an example of what a remarkable experience it was. Mm. And you were in the presence of this savage life force. You mm. know, his, yes, his neck would expand and his face went red and the but he never sweated i said how on earth <laughs> how do you i was dripping from just saying hello and i always am he, all he got was a tiny patch <laughs> there literally it was extraordinary and of course it was because he was so physically mm. relaxed mm. yes mm. he was he was an, a, an animal he was a lot of other wonderful things you could so, make, you could make as it. you can tell, I was rather obsessed by him, and that is the experience <laughs> of my life. There won't be one better, and that's with great respect to wonderful actors I'm with and things I've done, a few things I've done since. He could be quite naughty, though, I remember. Oh, yes. In, a, in Othello, Tony Hopkins and I were spear carriers at the back, <laughs> and most London bus conductors were black, and he was blacked up as Othello, and he used to walk along and say, your fares, please, no standing on the top. <laughs> we couldn't keep it together. Okay. Uh, under, under his breath, you know. <laughs> I think, can I just say that what was interesting about us as a company is that we were all more or less sort of in our early 30s, weren't we, I imagine? Yeah. So we'd all done a, a bit of acting yeah. and we were all ready to do, you know, more and the big stuff. And because he was so demanding and daring of, of himself, he was like that with us. Mm -hmm. And I mean, he gave us all these amazingly, amazing varied parts and great plays. And it was, uh, it was fantastic. And he was always part of the company. He was always in the canteen with us. And wasn't he? Yeah. Always. Yes. Yeah. Always. Ever God person. help you if you got stuck with him, you know? Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> you never knew what to say to him. The whole frightened of him. That, that was wonderful one. moment when he would visit us in the uh, rehearsal room, <laughs> rehearsing a play at Aquinas Street, where the actors face that way, stage management are along there, and the door into the rehearsal room was facing <laughs> with a little window in it. And around 11 o'clock-ish, after he got from Brighton and done a mountain of paperwork in his office, you would see, these are conveniently out, but you would see these horn-rimmed glasses behind this window yes. with a coffee cup held <laughs> very eccentric of it high up why i don't know i think so it didn't spill mm. coffee on his nice white shirt but he would open the door very discreetly shut it very discreetly and go over to a chair with a sort of body language of i'm not here I'm don't not. worry don't <laughs> worry <laughs> and it was of course the most riveting <laughs> <thing> <laughs> <of all> <laughs> discretion you you've ever seen and we all we all jacked our performance up if the rehearsal was going badly it could go even worse but um yeah. he was there his energy yeah do you remember the time geraldine when we were doing flea in her ear with jacques charol brilliant um uh, French director from the Comédie Française 
And we were rehearsing in Aquinas Street, which is where we used to rehearse. It was a terrible place with pillars <laughs> in all the wrong places, and it was like a nightmare. But that's where we rehearsed. However, it did have one advantage in that if the weather was good, you could have chairs outside. There was a sort of yard, <laughs> and we used to go and sit, uh, sit there you know, when we weren't on stage. And this uh, summer, it was very hot, and a lot of us had kind of taken quite a few clothes off, so we were kind of um, maybe in shorts and maybe a little vest or whatever. And um, <clears throat> then suddenly we, you were on stage and you were rushing back to get mm. on, you know, for the rehearsal. And this was one of the days when Sir Lawrence paid us a visit. And he sat in front of us, and we were all very scantily dressed for this rehearsal. And he just looked through those glasses, <laughs> and he undid his tie. <laughs> <laughs> took off his shoes <laughs> and his socks. He undid his puncture. <laughs> and he said, and he sat there and he said, now, is this the way that you would like to look at me if I were directing you? <laughs> well, I don't think your director is enjoying watching you. As I did. <laughs> 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 And he was right, he was right. Absolutely. But of course, Jacques Charol never said anything. Of course, Aquinas Street was, I mean, compared to the facilities in this building now, oh, Aquinas nice. Street was a lump of <laughs> wooden huts with low roofs yeah. in Off an old, I think, an old bomb site. Yeah. And, uh, the, the, the roof leaked in the rehearsal room, there were pillars that got in the way, yeah. and that yard outside, mm. you, you could kick a ball around, so you get a message sent out saying, can you keep the noise down so Lawrence can't hear himself rehearsing. Surrounded by flats from the house. That's right. <laughs> and there was a canteen run by two women. Oh, that's oh, yeah. right. Rose. Called Rose and Nell. 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 Rose and Nell. That's <laughs> right. And Ro Rose Nell. was very London and very hot and wonderful. Oh, can I get you? And it was a very yeah. hot summer. She'd be dishing up food there, and she was wonderful. Rose, very ebullient, and her glasses steamed up. And then behind her was Nell, who was her assistant. Now, as ebullient as, Nell, uh, as Rose was, Nell was this rather shrinking violet in the mm. background, <laughs> very kind of doing things very daintily. <laughs> and it was, you couldn't take your eyes off. <laughs> so Rose would be doing all that, and I remember when Maggie Smith, we were all queuing for lunch, and Maggie Smith was up at the, in the queue for the food, and someone said, isn't Rose marvelous, uh, She said, isn't Rose marvelous, why she's doing all this? And she said, yes, she said, but Nell's the better part. <laughs> <laughs> Very good acting, Good acting. Good acting. Good acting. Good acting. Good acting. <laughs> Go on, go on. You, be you became quite friendly with Sir Lawrence towards the end of his life. Yes, I did. He was like a surrogate father to me. He was absolutely wonderful. But what I remember very clearly about um, working with him and about the, um, his last performance, I was in a play with Ronnie uh, called The Party, Trevor Griffith's play, and um, he had a 20-minute speech in it. Yeah. And I remember very clearly on the first night, I was sitting next to him on the sofa, facing front, and at the Old Vic, they had a, an aisle in the middle uh, in those days. And I was sitting next to a furnace. And it was, it was so hot, I was getting hot myself. And just as he started the speech, I saw the back door open and John Dexter, who was the director, <laughs> and Joan Plowright leave. And jump from that, do you remember that? And, and on the last night of it, which was his last performance on any stage, ever. He, um, w we, we split a, as a company, we split and waited for him to come down between us. And he had this extraordinary walk. Mm. It was rather like a sailor. Uh, he, he, he was sort of like this <laughs> as he ambled down. And he would come down, he came down, he came down, and the house rose and cheered and cheered and cheered. And he stood there for a bit and went, is this for me? <laughs> <laughs> And then he knelt down oh. and he kissed the stage. Oh. And that's the last time he was wonderful. ever on a stage. And wonderful. it was just very, very exciting and wonderful to be there, wasn't it? Yeah. It was. Yep. Very magical. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah, but I, we didn't know it was the last one ever, but it, you guessed yeah, it, it didn't take long to yeah. know, and it yeah. was yeah. An incredibly yeah. moving. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was. Yeah. Evening, yeah. I, I remember you telling me quite a scary story about being about being alone in the canteen at breakfast. And oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, with, with, the, with the leather the leather case. Yeah, I mean, I was so frightened of him. I was so impressed by him. I didn't want to be on any camera sat opposite me. Yeah. I'm always two hours early for theatre work. I was at eight o'clock in the morning. He walked in, and he was just staring at me with those glasses. <laughs> I didn't know what to do, and I kept looking down, and I, I didn't know what to do. And I, and I saw a wallet on the table further up there, and, I, and it had on it N O R G E Nord Nord. <laughs> and I said to him, Nord. <laughs> I, he was just wanted to sit and relax. It was <laughs> really I, he said, what, what are you talking about? I said, on that, on that wallet, Nord, 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 sir. He said, Nord, what? I said, the time I must have given you that wallet when you played Amber in Norway. <laughs> he said, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> He said, it isn't my wallet anyway, and I don't know what the bloody hell you're talking about. <laughs> Shut up, walk away. I'm about that. <laughs> uh, didn't tell you Ansonor was in, in oh, Denmark. Yeah, so. yeah, he said, I got the place wrong, didn't I? Isn't it? Where's I don't know. I, don't know. I, don't know. I never knew. But I went to him after I'd spent three and a half years there, and I went to his office with, and uh, asked him for better parts. <laughs> And he said, well, I, I can't do that at the moment. He said, but you can go and get yourself, leave here and go to a provincial theatre. And uh, I think he got me into Birmingham Rep. I don't know if it was he, he got me. The next day I was offered a, a season there. So he must have made a call. Sure he did. Mm. He was quite, he was really good. He could be so kind. I remember when I was understudying Geraldine um, in Flea in Her Ear. And it was terrifying because the pace of it was so, so fast. And um, <clears throat> I had one run through with the company and I was really, really frightened. And a message mm -hmm. came from Sir Lawrence that um, I couldn't get ready in my own dressing room. I had to come down to her dressing room because that was the star dressing room and I was going to play a star part. So I got my little makeup bag and I came down and, and that was even more frightening to be in somebody else's dressing room. And anyway, um, that was fine, and he came in, and he actually, I mean, come on, I'm an understudy going on for uh, somebody at a matinee. He bothered to come to the performance. Mm. In the interval, I came off, went straight for the script. He came into the dressing room, and he said, what are you doing, darling? Uh, I said, I'm just looking at the script for the next bit. He said, um, oh, we don't do that in the star dressing room, he said. We have a little split of champagne. In the <laughs> <laughs> and so we had a little split of champagne, and he said, your arms are a little tense, he said, baby. Let me give you a little massage. <laughs> Massaged my arms, drank the champagne. I was brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how kind, how remarkable to do that. You know, he made such demands of himself that he made them of us. You know, we were going to do Guys and Dolls at one point. Yeah. And I heard they were going to do Guys and Dolls, and I thought, how fabulous, you mm. know. And um, anyway, I passed him in a Aquinas Street, and he said, oh, you, do you know we're going to do Guys and Dolls? And I said, yes, fabulous. And he said, I'm going to play Nathan Detroit. And I said, well, that's incredible, you know. And he said, I want you to play Adelaide. And I said, well, I've, I've never been in a musical. I've never <laughs> sung. I haven't danced. So he said, yeah, that's all right, you're, you're doing it. <laughs> he said, but you've got to get the accent absolutely perfect. <laughs> and it was extraordinary, because I then went to an American actress in London, and I mm. got the accent from her, but partly because she started with the physicality of the woman, with the hips thrust forward, you know, and a, a sort of um, singer-dancer. And I did, you know, I did, and then I worked on the accent. But then, of course, it was cancelled. So it was a great shame. Oh, but he kept on to me to rehearse the number Sue Me, Sue Me, Shoot Bullets Through Me, I Love You. And um, I did. And honestly, 
You can imagine, can't you? He was going to be wonderful. Mm. And I said to him, oh, well, I can see why he wants to do guys and dolls. Yeah, it was a, just a fantastic part for him. It was very sad, wasn't it? Yes, it was Were you sad. there with all that? Yes, yes, I'd love him to have done that. Yeah, it would have been fantastic. But, but well, they were, diff they were different <laughs> days. All through those years, he was having to fight with the board and fight yes. the establishment. And of course, now we don't have to do that. It's a, the things have changed completely. We have it very, very easy. So he was not only on stage, he was not only acting and directing and running the company, he was in a running battle um, with, um, with, with the British establishment, who, in the way the British establishment used to be, thought they knew how to run theatres better than he did. So, which, so that, yeah. that was quite That's what happened with Guys and Dolls, wasn't it? We rehearsed. The board cancelled it. We, we, we got <coughs> very far. We yeah. rehearsed some of the numbers and, mm. and all that, didn't mm. we? Absolutely. Yes, because I thought you might have been in the chorus of the men singing. Oh, singing. I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> but the actors, yeah. the actors, these marvellous actors who became famous, well, have become famous, were all singing, Sit, sit down, you're rocking the boat. You know, it was a fantastic <laughs> cast. Yeah. Incredible, yes. It yeah. was such a shame. <laughs> I saw a great another great performance by him in uh, the recruiting officer, oh, oh, yes. Yes. Uh, which yeah. was uh, yeah. Bill Gaskill yeah. directed, yeah. and yeah. It, it broke the whole mold of uh, the old-fashioned way of playing restoration comedy with yeah. all that fancy oh, yeah. stuff. Yeah. People come on with muddy boots if they're ridden across the country, yeah. and he played. Was it was it brazen the character? Yeah, yes. Yes. Brazen. Yes. Brazen. and he had yeah. this wonderful. He kept, he and Robert Stevens, every time they met, they kissed on the lips. Right. Yeah. Do you remember? Yeah, and thing. he had these wonderful <laughs> eyes. That he was kind of stupid. The kind of very stupid. And he never seemed to focus on it. I don't know how he did it. Yeah. It made him look, oh, it was a wonderful, funny, funny performance. Yeah. We have a tiny, we have a tiny snatch of it. The, the film from the back of the old Vic is going to be part of the Oh, uh, yeah. uh, oh, uh, oh how lovely. Yeah. Just a, a, a few seconds, but you could just get a, a, a kind of scratchy, a scratchy reminder of what it must have been like. Mm. Okay. Talking of restoration comedy, just very briefly, there was a wonderful moment when a bunch of us, Derek and so on, we used to sit up in the circle watching a rehearsal offering. We were known as the Knitting Club <laughs> by John Dexter. But uh, we were sitting there watching this mm. rehearsal of Tartuffe in which <coughs> the late Robert Stevens was playing Tartuffe and Sir John Gielgud had been invited to play Orgon, a part which he was not happy in. I mean, he said, he was, oh, I'm terrible, it's not my part at all. <laughs> <coughs> anyway, we came to this dress rehearsal and uh, he came on with a terrible wig. Jeremy Brett muttered, he looks like the Gooseberry Fool. <laughs> Which he did, sort of. He was dreadful. He was not happy. And he sat down and he did some of the dialogue at the opening. And he said, oh, Larry, uh, I really am finding this ter terribly difficult. And Sir Lawrence and Tyron Guthrie, two of the giants of the theatre, along with Gilbert, were standing there in the stalls near to the stage. And Larry said, well, what, what's your problem, Johnny? It really is so stupid of you. You look marvellous and you're going to be marvellous. You're marvellous at restoration comedy. All you need to do is get up and move around a bit. You know how to do it. Here, let me show you. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it was, he did it. <laughs> oh, I can't do it like you, Larry. It was absolutely adorable. These three giants to us having a little... <laughs> <laughs> so, d uh, what, what would you say was the most memorable show each of you did at the Old Vic? Not necessarily with Sir Lawrence. Which, which, if, you, if you look back to the Old Vic days, to the, the first decade of the National Theatre, which, which would be the one you remember with most affection? Geraldine. Cool, oh, that's hard. Um, oh, I don't know really. Well, d oh, well maybe. In her ear, but uh, well, and of course, Dance of Death and White Devil was an enormous favourite of mine. Mm. Uh, Flea in her ear, would, would, was, it, was it one of the, in legend, it's walls of laughter. Yeah, it was wonderful, know. and we had this marvellous director, yeah. Jack Sharon. He didn't speak English, and the first day of rehearsal, um, he, because uh, he, I was sp start rehearsing quite sort of gently in a way, and he said, No, oh, no, 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 with farce, it's no. Mm. Like this, you know, and uh, he then um, gave a, a, a short because he couldn't speak English, also. And he, you could tell he was funny from the 
tip of his toes to the top of his head. He was a great performer as well as a great director. And he, he um, <laughs> played a little bit of my part and I thought, oh God, that's it. I shall never be able to do it now. Because we all laughed and all that and it was so funny and wonderful. And I thought, that's it. I'm never going to be able to do it. Anyway, I went home and had a good sort of think about it and I thought, don't be so stupid. You must take from him everything he's got. And um, then we really went for it. And um, it was amazing. Um, he was terrific. He, he kind of knew absolutely where all of us should be, which is quite important in a farce, mm -hmm. isn't it? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, all the characters he defined so marvellously. And it was like getting, at the beginning of an evening, it was like getting on a roundabout and you didn't get off till the end of the play and we all went round and round and round. Mm -hmm. I suppose it was. But I was in it for five years, on and off. Edward Hardwick and I, because you know there were, um, you know, new co other people came people. into it. So we probably rehearsed it more than we played it. Mm. And um, Edward Hardwick and I were the only originals at the end of five years. Oh, yeah. So it was, so you know that used to happen. You used to hang on to plays for quite a long time. Mm. Yeah, Gosh. that was wonderful. <laughs> What about Royal Hunt of the Sun? You were in. You were I in was in that. Yeah. 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 Oh, that was no, not on the at the Old Vic. At the Old Vic. Yes. 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 Yeah. That was hard. John Dexter. Yeah. yeah. John Dexter. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that lasted for years, didn't we? Yeah. Nearly killed us. <laughs> but I like. But my favourite is. Uh, with, I'm getting confused. It was this on this stage, like Galileo. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah that but was that's later, isn't it? That is right. later. Yeah. I get yeah. confused. Yeah, you were amazing in Galileo. Well, but, um, <laughs> even <laughs> <laughs> I was around by then. I'll, yeah. vouch, I'll vouch for Galileo. Oh, yeah. Thanks very much. It was good. Jimmy, what about you? I, I did a production of um, The Misanthrope with John Dexter, yeah. with Alec McCowan, which I thought was really, really good. But I think the one I loved the best was uh, The Front Page, which Michael Blakemore yeah, directed. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> which was, was is such a wonderful play, one of the great, great comedies, mm -hmm. one of the yeah. great American plays. And Michael did an extraordinary production of it. Yeah. He was a great film fan, and he had a lot of tricks, uh, phys uh, tricks on the set, like uh, bullet holes, were, um, would, um, powder would fly off the walls as bullet holes, um, yeah. you know, all that. And uh, there was a wonderful bit when someone came through this window, and the, the speed, I remember think he, him making us work faster. Mm -hmm. Never been was worked. This or? No, this is Michael, oh. playing it. That, that quick, that repartee of those reporters uh, was, mm. was wonderful, wonderful. Mm. But on the misanthrope with John Dexter, uh, I'll tell you a funny story. It's one rude word, if you don't mind, because he, he was a strange man, but he was good. That's all he ever used. That's all he ever used. <laughs> I, was, I was rehearsing a scene with, with uh, Alec McCown, and we were, we were kind of pleased with the scene, you know, we thought it was going very nicely. And John was very pleased, and Diana Rigg, everyone was very pleased. It was all going to be a big success. So Alec and I were doing the scene one day, and we were corpsing a little bit during it. And John, who could turn very quickly, uh, we did the scene. We felt, I suppose, slightly self-satisfied. And there was a pause. And John said, I suppose you think that scene's funny. He said, that scene is about as funny as a child's open grave. <laughs> <laughs> Do it again. We never smiled after that. <laughs> Oh, terrible. he was. He was frightening. Oh. He would sack people, all that. Oh, thing. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that that yeah. I, I, don't, I don't think I'm going to try that one out. <laughs> <laughs> Michael York was sacked by him, wasn't he? Oh, well, yeah, I was in a show he sacked somebody, yeah. yes, yeah. yes, yes. Terrible. And he nearly sacked you, didn't he? I don't know. Maybe you did. I can't remember. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you told me you did because you were late. Oh, when I oh, yeah. that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I was wearing a suit of armour in, well, I don't know what the play, he directed it, yeah. and I took the armour off because I didn't have to appear at the end for bowing, yeah. and ran up the, the road, Waterloo Road, Waterloo Road, and there's Dexter coming towards me. <laughs> so I dived back down the side, uh, up the stairs. He'd already run down the body. To, I had the armour back on and I was all right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he came back through the stage door. He was furious. <laughs> he couldn't attack me because he couldn't prove anything. <laughs> so I was nearly the same. Are you remem remembering the story about when you were late two mornings in a row? For oh, yeah, time? my mother, yeah. So I <laughs> was late and he said, if anyone's late here, they're out. So I was late two mornings running. I've never been late since. And uh, on the way up the staircase, I started crying. 
at the Old Vic, and I really was crying. And as I walked in through the room to the rehearsal room, there's Maggie Smith over there, I was the tears streaming down my face. And uh, she said, what's the matter? I said, my, 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 my mum died last night. My mother died last night. And of course she hadn't. <laughs> <laughs> but it was... <laughs> it's the only thing that Dexter would have responded to. I, mean, I knew, I had to say that. I mean, I, I, my mum knew the next day, I told her, and she just laughed. But, but in, in Maggie reminds me to this day of that the day when I walked in. Oh with my, they always ask me, well, how's my mum, you know? <laughs> but with Dexter, that's all you could do. Oh, yes, had yes. Anything less than that, you'd be out. When we did Galileo here, yeah. and John was reminding you of that incident, of your mother dying. Yes. And I, I, oh, I, yeah, I remember you writing, it, yeah. you're, you're, your mother couldn't come and see the show because she was up in Streatham or something. That's right, yeah. Until he went back to New York. Yeah. Couldn't I couldn't come bring her to see Galileo. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, but she enjoyed Galileo, but he was well back there. <laughs> I don't know what he was back. <laughs> uh, Sheila, your, your favorite memory, can you? Oh, golly, that's really hard. Um, it's a mix of either the Three Sisters or the Crucible. Um, the Crucible, I, I love. I mean, he did a brilliant. Uh, Sir Lawrence did a brilliant production of that, and I loved doing it. And um, that was another, um, actually, a wonderful memory about him and how brilliant and off the cuff he could be. We were doing the technical, and it was going on and on and on like they do. And there was a, a, a message came over the tannoy. Would all the girls in the um, courtroom scene uh, come uh, to Aquinas Street because we, we need to sort something out? So we all trooped off to Aquinas Street thinking, oh my God, a rehearsal and what have we done wrong and how dreadful this is going to be. Tables with wine and glasses, lovely bottles of wine. Sir Lawrence there saying, all right, girlies, we're going to have a party. So we're all drinking wine and it's all wonderful. And then after we've all uh, been there for about half an hour having a lovely time, he says, let's do that scene now, the courtroom scene. Let's just <coughs> give it all the welly we can give it. And then we'll take it back and we'll show those boys and we'll blow their heads off. And of course, by that time, we were all absolutely <laughs> fine. And so we did it and it was magnificent and thrilling. And we ran back into the theater and it was just the right moment. And we ran on stage and we absolutely hit the roof of the scene. And he'd achieved what he'd been trying to get out of us all through rehearsals, just by that extraordinarily clever, delightful ploy. Mm. And there we were, we never lost it because you had that sort of at the back of your ear all the time. Mm. So that was a pretty good memory. And Ro Ronnie and Gordon? Well, I can't go on about long day's journey tonight again because it was mm. my most, for me, most memorable. But there was a moment, uh, his wonderful humour and the fact that he was ever present. I was in Royal Hunt of the Sun, as mm. a lot of us were. You were either an Indian or a Spaniard. And both were pretty hellish. Span oh, Indian horrible. was horrible because yeah, you had all that stuff. Bowl up. But you also understudied, sometimes rather inconveniently, a Spaniard. <laughs> <laughs> and this afternoon there was a matinee. Um, Dan Needham, a wonderful oh, big man, huge, yeah. huge giant. actor, giant, a gentle giant, huge, was playing the blacksmith. Got it? Big. I was understudying him. <laughs> and need I say more? And uh, that afternoon he was off. He got a flu bug or something. He couldn't possibly go on. So I was. There wasn't even time to remeasure. And word went round that there was a, a bit of a takeover going on. And Sir Lawrence was around the building, and he came in to watch a bit. <laughs> And uh, there I was in the opening scene where Colin Blakely comes on and uh, does the recruiting scene. And we all get up and go off and the, 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 the first half trundled along. It was well rehearsed play by then. He knocked on the dressing room door at the interval and he, um, Ronnie, I think it's, it's very stupid that they've given you this part to understudy. 
You look like Dan Maiden pricked. <laughs> so I was excused thereafter, <laughs> understudying Dan Mead. Thank God. Ah, God bless him. Go, okay. go on, we, we're going to wrap up very soon. Okay, I remember uh, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. <coughs> and in, thank you. <laughs> Towards the end of the, uh, the rehearsals, uh, Franco Zeffirelli was directing it. And there was one huge, major row when Franco accused of all, all of us of doing dreadful send-up Italian accents, and we were all rubbish, and, and he walked out. And <coughs> I happened to be uh, walking in as he was walking out. <laughs> the Franco's gone. And so then L L L Lawrence invited us all back into the stalls, and he sat on the edge of the stage, and he said, darlings, would you mind if I take over the direction? <laughs> and we all said, no, of course not, of course not, which he did. And uh, then we got to the first night, and you could smell <laughs> success. <laughs> and in the wings was Franco. <coughs> and needless to say, Franco won the Evening Standard <laughs> Best Director <laughs> Award. <laughs> 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 Uh, I wish we could go on all evening, oh, but geez. they have to get ready for Edward II tonight. Would you join me in saying thank you to these six <laughs> <laughs>